Any health advice given, whether general, diet, physical or spiritual, is general only and must be verified by your doctor. If you need medical advice, please consult a doctor. Assalamu alaikum and welcome uh, to all our listeners and viewers. Uh, I welcome you all to another exciting and education, uh, educating edition of the Health and Fitness Show. I'm Fahad Martin, your host for today's uh, show, and I hope and pray that all of us are fit and healthy by the grace of Almighty Allah. I do pray that uh, we are having a nice time. Uh, this program is recorded and broadcast from the platform of Inspire FM uh, and casting his wife to all our lovely people in Luton and all the surrounding surrounding areas of Luton. But it shows so we have uh, this is one of the toolkit shows which we have recorded purely purely for the knowledge and as you can see on the top uh, on my screen or people who are listening to me on this uh, on the on the radio today we are talking about a very very unique topic uh, and the topic for today is paramedic services yes indeed in this day and age where we are suffering and we have gone through lengths and lengths uh, of different hardship uh, one of the people who we <laughs> normally rely on most of the time is paramedic uh, whether we're calling 999 or even uh, nowadays we can see paramedics in different places like gp surgeries or somebody's calling us or even paramedics are jamming us uh, with the flu vaccination or even uh, covid vaccinations so it is very very unique and their role has grown into a very bit and luckily I am joined by three lovely paramedics. So when I will be talking about our topic today, they are the ones. So uh, let's start with you, Tracy. Thanks, Fahad. I'm Tracy Nichols. I'm the chief exec of the College of Paramedics. I've been a paramedic for 27 years and did about 24 of those in Luton. So uh, thank you so much for inviting us on the show this evening. Wow. Wow. That's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, Graham? Thank you, Farhad. Uh, so my name's Graham Clark. I, I'm also a paramedic as well. I've been a paramedic for about 10 years and uh, I work with the East of England Ambulance Service in the recruitment department and I'm also a council member for the College of Paramedics as well. Perfect. Uh, welcome, Graham. And last but not uh, least, uh, we call him Izzy, but his name is Islam. So, Izzy? My name's uh, Islam Fakir. Um, I am a paramedic, obviously, also. I'm currently working as a clinical pathways manager for Yorkshire Ambulance Service. I've been a paramedic for 15 years, but worked for the ambulance service for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, wow. I'm also the chair of the diversity steering group for the College of Paramedics also. Perfect, perfect. And it's, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and welcome to the Health and Fitness Show, guys. Uh, as the show says, the the services of uh, the paramedic service itself is very very crucial to us and whenever we 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 say paramedic the first thing comes in our mind uh, is uh, the role what role it is because as as i said it's in the beginning the role has very much diversified and and we see paramedics and in, in pretty much everywhere previously in, in past days i remember the only place paramedics comes in like firemen are with the ambulance when we call 999 and there we are uh, uh two or uh, three people wa walking in just like firemen and and uh, growing up most kids literally look up to you guys to become a paramedic so let me start by asking the role of paramedic in the modern health services what are the roles nowadays so i think Fahad, we, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, in, in not so long ago, the, the paramedic was traditionally based in an ambulance. Um, but now the paramedic is part of a wider team of people who have different skill sets. So we work with other uh, allied health professions such as physiotherapists and dietitians and uh, occupational therapists. But our, our main role and probably what we know most for is to respond to emergency or urgent calls and assess patients, stabilize them, treat them, and then signpost or take them to the most appropriate place. Um, but that that is just the ambulance service part of it. We've got paramedics now working in 
GP surgeries in primary care, as you said, doing the vaccinations, being part of that whole COVID program. We've got paramedics on oil rigs. They're working in hospital departments. They're working in neonatal. So with you know babies and young children, the paramedics have such a generalist view and such a generalist skill set that they can actually work anywhere because our bread and butter is just walking into the unknown and mm -hmm. dealing with what we see. Indeed. And and as you just clearly mentioned, emergency is one of those few things which which paramedics are trained to to uh, to handle mm -hmm. and and make most of it because those times, those crucial times are very time sensitive and, and critical. And you guys have to make uh, a near near uh, second decisions as in what to do and how to do it, which is perfect. And I I respect you guys. I respect you guys. But in in general way, one of the common things people do find it hard to understand is the word emergency because the emergency changes the word emergency changes its meaning from person to person emergency for me is different than the emergency for yourself or Graham for Izzy so if I ask if you don't mind me asking what is an actual medical emergency and when should we call 999 and ask for an emergency uh, ambulance services so what do you say on that so I think I'll, I'll kick off and I'm sure the, the, the guys want to come in and, and help. But the, the emergency really is for those things where you think your life is in danger. That's what we would class as an emergency. And you're absolutely right, Fahad. Emergency means different things to different people. But we would say if you're having terrible crushing chest pain, if you're choking, mm -hmm. if you're bleeding severely, and when I say severely, it's not like a cut finger or a small nosebleed. This is so much blood that it scares you and everyone else around you. Um, if you've had a severe allergic reaction, something like that is is when we would want you to call us because things like that can evolve really quickly and you're very, very soon out of your comfort zone and where you can help the person that you're with or even yourself. And we're highly trained to, to deal with uh, issues such as, such as that. And as we're living through COVID, severe breathing problems, when you are fighting for breath, is when you should call 999. Uh, Graham and Izzy, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, and I think there's um, there's some variants as well that we um, rightfully uh, go to as well, which, uh, as you've already said, fired is uh, an emergency is a different thing to everybody, and certainly someone who may be frail and elderly who's fallen on the floor uh, is warranted as an emergency call because uh, they that person, if they can't be uh, assisted back onto their feet, will deteriorate while waiting uh, for assistance. So we would absolutely uh, value those sort of calls coming through to the to the 999 service for a, a fast response. But also we look at some of our mental health patients and some of the mental health conditions where people need immediate help as well. So it's not just a physical emergency but we also have um, sort of psychological emergencies and social emergencies as well where rightfully we the paramedics are called out to assess. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing I'd like to add is obviously where people are possibly having a stroke, people obviously having a stroke, having chest pains, breathing difficulties, you know, serious road traffic collision, all of those sorts of things would constitute an emergency. Mm -hmm. And and I agree on that and majority of the time because myself i i'm involved in calling 999 uh, when my mother was poorly when my my niece uh, was start fitting mm -hmm. and and my son uh, was choking badly and could not able to breathe at all i have called and i have seen the response time and it was perfect and there are times when i've seen my my wife, she stopped breathing she was my my because me and my wife were of a kind of we have been given the first aid training for for uh, for kids. We have learned because we have so many kids in our household, so we understand that. But in a general way, when people call nine nine nine, they always says, "Why the ambulance is not here? The kid, the person is literally passing away. Why they are taking long?" Although ambulance time, response time, in my personal opinion, is like those five minutes. What's the time? Because I have been through that position myself. It is long, 
that five minutes feels like five hours because you are in a very, very awkward mindset. So if you don't mind my asking, and uh, Graham, I'm throwing it to you because uh, you you deal kind of these kind of things kind of multiple angles. So what happened when somebody called 999? What happened in the background? And I do like both Tracy uh, as your experience because you have seen these things from different angles and, and Izzy from your experience as well to jump in. But Graham, uh, let me ask you what happened when we call 999? So initially uh, you'll be asked what kind of service that you require, whether it be police, fire, ambulance, and there are other organisations that you can contact through the 999 service. Mm -hmm. So once you've, uh, if it's a medical emergency, for example, and you've uh, opted for the ambulance, that would be connected through to one of uh, the ambulance operation centres that would take the 999 call. We have staff that are qualified and trained to uh, take the details down of that 999 call in a very set criteria that's uh, designed nationally to take uh, information at a very quick pace to, mm -hmm. to get a very clear indication as to whether this is a time critical emergency or uh, whether this is something that we just need a little bit more information about. If it's a time critical emergency, the call handler will start to um, give some instructions to those individuals that are called try and calm that situation down. They're very highly trained in do, trying to manage the situation to try and get people to initiate emergency treatment while the ambulance is en route. Uh, there might be someone else that can step in and help with that call process and uh, give some further guidance to allow someone else to concentrate on making sure the right resources are sent to the patient. But generally speaking, in, in that period of time, if it's life-threatening emergency, that's what will be happening. Alternatively, if it's decided by the system that the patient doesn't necessarily need an instant emergency response, that call could be directed to another person in terms of a clinician in the same department or a different um, sector, section of the uh, organisation. And that clinician, whether it be a paramedic, it could be a nurse, it could be a mental health specialist, uh, would then take ownership of that call and um, call maybe potentially call that person back at a later, uh, shortly after they've made that initial 999 call and do a little bit more of a triage, uh, try and understand the call a little bit better. It might still warrant a, an ambulance to be dispatched, but then they might also uh, send an alternative resource or, or signpost that person to a, a completely different avenue of care as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, that is so, <laughs> so unique in many different ways that what's happening in the background it's not that easy to for a person like a lem and myself uh, i think to it's understand. important for had as well to to just ask your listeners that we know this is really difficult when you're making a 999 call the calmer you can be and the more you listen to the questions um, they may seem like random bizarre questions but they're asked for a purpose and the more information we can get from you, the better the responses that we can give you. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Izzy, do you want to add anything to it? Um, I mean, just obviously what Tracy and uh, Graham have said, but, you know, where we are taking a little bit longer to get to, that's not because, you know, you're not a priority. You may well be a priority. However, if there's no ambulance to send here, you know, that's where the delay comes from because unfortunately there's not an ambulance for every patient out there um, in the country, you know, and, and, and that's where some of these delays happen, which is why, you know, reinforcing what Tracy just said, it's really important that you answer the questions that the call takers are asking you um, because they're being asked for a purpose um, and obviously what, what you answer will influence whatever the call is graded at. Yeah, indeed. And I, I absolutely understand uh, Tracy's uh, point because <laughs> there was a time uh, a, a while back, not too long ago, uh, when the when the peak, when the COVID peak started, uh, I was being uh, physically assaulted uh, right outside my house and I was on the floor for an hour before the ambulance arrived. And, and the reason be behind ambulance arrival was late because the questions which was asked by my, uh, by the ambulance service to my younger brother he was answering it and according to the answers the the emergency seems like very light and i was completely knocked out the blood was everywhere and the police arrived and says why well, the ambulance is not there so when police explained that the ambulance was there in, in like a couple of mm -hmm. minutes time mm -hmm. so i i absolutely understand and i absolutely understand islam uh, your point as well because 
it is very very important for us to explain it properly why why we are doing this and what need to be done in a right way but anyhow let's move on to to to, to the section where uh, where when paramedic arrives one of the other things uh, people do not understand is that what happened when paramedics arrive what a person should do because one of the things we we yes we see paramedic and yes they're there and they're there to help it they're there to sort it out so technically speaking what would a paramedic do when when they attend a medical emergency call so the initial the initial uh, sort of thing would be that we would get some brief very brief details uh, on our computer screen as we are commencing our journey to that patient um, we might get some additional information sent down to us or, or radioed across from our dispatchers to give us a bit more information as and, as and when that because that, a lot of the time that call is still ongoing as the ambulance is en route so we will arrive on scene with some vague information about what we're going to. Uh, so the initial sort of thing is to be uh, looking at for any sort of hazards or danger to the crew to make sure that that is the that this scene is a safe to approach and it's not going to jeopardise the safety of the crew. And um, once they've gained access and they and they're pa patient face to face with the patient, they'll make a very quick primary survey. They will um, make sure that the patient's not critically ill. Uh, they'll check the patient's uh, airway and breathing and check that their heart's beating properly and, that, and they've got a good strong pulse and things like that. Um, all the time that sort of ascertaining as to what the cause for the call of 909 was to do, was for. Um, once you've ascertained that maybe it's not such a life-threatening emergency, then we start going into what we call a secondary survey, which involves sort of taking a patient's history, uh, their medical history, looking at some of their medication, getting a full understanding of what's caused that person to need uh, a frontline ambulance to, to that date, and uh, what's happened recently in the past in terms of some of their medical history uh, that their doctors are aware of. And uh, it's all about gathering a good picture as to what we're there for. Uh, we'll do all the patient assessments. There are quite a lot of what will, would be done in a hospital can be done in the patient's home. And the role of the paramedic is to sort of collate all that information, uh, work with their colleagues that they've crewed with, if they're, if they're dual crewed ambulance, for example, and gather that information together, access the GP uh, for additional information if that's required as well, and just formulate a plan and involve other services if needs be, and uh, decide whether that patient warrants going to hospital, whether that's a need for that patient, uh, or whether they could seek alternative care from a different service provider. But clearly, if it was a life-threatening emergency, uh, the paramedic would uh, give sort of drug to, drug medication, interventions and things like that, and it would be a, a quick trip to the most appropriate hospital. Mm -hmm. And and Izzy, I just need to, um, a bit of a more clarification that uh, from the, as you are the diversity head background, um, what happened if, if, if any of the paramedics end up in, in a household where the attendance is a female and the guy is a, the, the paramedic is a male female Asian lady so how do we there, there must be some kind of problem yeah. well I mean with, with with any sort of sort of like um, you know when we're attending to a job and diversity is an issue and cult, there's cultural differences I mean I've had that where I've been to an house and it's been an Asian house and I've been the only person there in the car and this lady was having a baby and the husband was reluctant for me to go inside and help. And I said, look, I appreciate what you're saying. You know, there is backup on its way. However, your wife's having a baby. The most important thing is your wife and your baby. You know, I'm here to help, so to speak. So I understand where you're coming from, but you've got to let me, you know, help this patient. So, you know, an example where I've been working with a female member of the staff and we've gone to a house and we need to do some observations that's just common sense. You know, I will step to one side and let my colleague do, you know, the observations in the sense where if they need to do um, an ECG, you know, where they're checking the heart and they've got to put sticky dots on the chest, I will totally leave the room and just stand outside. You know, and we are sort of like culturally aware, but there is certain situations where you're talking about life and death situations where we've just got to get on and do our job. So we do try our best, you know, to respect culture, etc. However, there are instances where that may not be possible. And those instances are where it's literally life and death. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, wow, the time has passed so quickly. It's already a uh, few minutes to the show. And 
one of the things I am extremely intrigued about is how to become a paramedic. Now, it is something which most of us do want to make. So, for our listeners who want to become a paramedic, what do they need to do? Okay, so uh, the the paramedic uh, profession is uh, overseen by what we call the Healthcare Professional Council, and they they have a um, process where they would honour someone who's gone through a process of education with a paramedic registration uh, number. Uh, so it's a protected um, registration. Uh, you can go to university now and uh, learn to become a paramedic through a BSE programme. There are 48 providers across the UK in total offering that programme. And uh, they will, most of them will have placements with their local ambulance service as well as part of that education. And it's usually about a three year education programme. Someone wanting to uh, learn about um, paramedic science would normally come in with a GCSE maths and English and maybe some science uh, exam results. Uh, A-levels are obviously preferred as well for the entry criteria onto the university programme. Uh, they will ha ideally have a driving licence to, to come in at uh, ambulance, level, ambulance service level paramedic, but that's not necessarily required for paramedic work without outside of the ambulance service, for example, into GP surgery. Uh, so that would be the criteria that a university would look at. And in terms of finding a course and finding out more information, if you go onto the College of Paramedics website, uh, that would all be on there and uh, signpost you to the relevant uh, places and give you a lot more information about what you where to go to become a paramedic. Mm -hmm. Now, Tracy, I'm coming towards you to ask you this. What opportunities are there for a qualified paramedic? Oh, my goodness, bad. What? What opportunity isn't there would be the easier thing to say, I think. So it literally opens the door for so many things. I mean, it, you can work within the NHS and, you know, paramedics love people. That's mm -hmm. why we do the, the role we do. We love people. We love to help people. But mm -hmm. you can you can work in uh, the film industry, the sports industry, uh, hospitality. You can uh, you can work in sort of consultancy. So, um, you know, paramedics who are following some of the well, were until COVID following the rock stars around looking after them while they're doing their concerts. Um, it really is a, a kind of golden key for you to be able to use your skills in a way that keeps people safe. that We'd rather keep people safe rather than go to them in an accident. We want mm. them to be safe first. Uh, so we're there if they get hurt. In, in a nutshell, become a paramedic and you don't have to worry about not having a work uh, and, and and you will have a double whammy by saving people's lives as well have a have a regular job as well <laughs> is he need to come towards you and ask you the very final one because before i ask you guys to to uh, to give a positive message what kind of a diversity uh, uh, why diversity is very much among paramedics important as okay. such well, i'll answer that in a minute a moment but just to add to what graham said i mean going through the university route is not the only option to becoming a paramedic, there's lots of ambulance services where you can join and, and, and take that route through the apprenticeship. So it might take you a little bit longer, but the advantages of that is the organisation pays for it. Uh, and in terms of diversity, well, you know, for me, a workforce should be representative to the population it serves. So within Yorkshire, I think we've got, I think, 15% minorities within, within Yorkshire and Humberside. However, our workforce is only 5%, so it's not representative to our population. Promoting equality and diversity ensures people are valued and have access to all opportunities regardless of difference. Investing in a diverse workforce enables us to be more inclusive and it's proven that it improves patient care also. Diversity leads to improved health and better, better staff and patient experience. Increased engagement can lead to better health outcomes and also reduce deaths in hospital. And there's lots, lots of literature out there. Diversity is very important, um, you know, especially for minority communities. I, I didn't have anyone that I could aspire to be, so to speak. So I see myself as a role model. I encourage people from my community to join the ambulance service um, because, I mean, this is something that I am passionate about. I must be passionate about it because I've been here 20 years um, and I wanted a career. I, I, I applied within Yorkshire Ambulance Service for two years before I got a job and I started on PTS and that was just driving people to appointments, outpatient appointments and then I've gradually worked my way up. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. And final comments from uh, both you, Graham and Tracy. Uh, yeah. But I, I think a positive message, listen, 
be be kind to one another. This is a this has been a horrible year. Uh, we've we've seen a number of, of paramedics succumb to COVID, and I know that the communities that listen to you, Fahad, will have lost people very close to them, and it is it's a horrific time. So we want to spread kindness to people. We want to spread that message of you know there there is an end to this. The vaccine is on the horizon. We're coming out of this. So stay positive. Look after one another. Uh, and if we can help you in your time of need, we'll be there. Perfect, Graham. I, I don't think I could say it much better, to be honest. But uh, just it certainly um, have a happy and safe uh, holiday season, and uh, enjoy yourself safely. And thanks very much for for taking time to listen to us about our profession. Perfect. Thank you so much for being part of this show and such a lovely guest. And and on that note, I must say thank you all for joining us today. Uh, keep listening to uh, Health and Fitness Show on Inspire FM. And definitely, if you want to view us, you can always view us on uh, our Facebook channels as well as our YouTube channels, uh, other than listening us on the radio. But uh, that's all for tonight. Uh, stay safe, as as uh, Tracy says. Stay safe, as Graham says. Enjoy your time off. Uh, take care. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>